Well, thank you. Um, I, I have to say that it was about four weeks ago or so I decided to bring my dad with me to go to a speaking engagement. And how many of you have parents who don't know what you actually do? <laughs> so I bring him over there and they, they go through a very similar situation where they talk about all these things I did and I can see my dad in the back like this and I, I get done with the session and I said, Dad, so what did you think? And he goes, I was really caught up with one thing. And I said, what was it? And he said, it was your introduction. And I'm like, that was at the beginning. And he goes, yes, um, they didn't talk about all the bad things you did. <laughs> and I said, well, what bad things? He's like, you know, you were in second grade and you threw eggs at your sister. When you were and you did all these other things. You had a party when you were in high school, all of that. And I said, well, all right. So what about the session? I mean, did you understand now what I do? And he goes, no, I was rewriting your bio the whole time. <laughs> well, it's interesting because uh, uh, as you hear all of those great things, um, obviously I'm just like, like all of us trying to figure out what, what this generation is doing. I'm going to spend some time over the next 40 minutes talking about this generation of those between the ages of 20 and 30. Now, what's interesting is, is that this conversation is not new. Think about it for a minute. Do we have any boomers in the room? Yeah. yeah. What do you think your parents said about you? Do, they th do you think that they thought that you would be the most active and civically involved as they were? Well, here's an interesting thing. Historically, even the media, as you'll see right here, they will tend to heighten up this conversation about generational issues. In fact, if you work, uh, for, the, for Time Magazine in and of itself, it is likely that you will be a part of a generational study or, or article over the course of your period there. What's interesting though about Time, they didn't realize that we could find all of these, is, is that there are actually two. They resurfaced the Me, Me, Me generation title in the 2013 when they also talked about it in 97 and also in 67. Well, here's something else that's interesting. One of the most common cited research pieces that's out there right now is a study that is done two years after you graduate from college. I would like all of you to remember what life was like two years right after college. Were you a little bit concerned about yourself just for a little bit? Well, it's true. So we always talk about narcissism. We talk about all of these things. And I can tell you that after studying 35,000 millennials who have gone through our studies since 2009, this is the most generationally cause-interested group of people I have ever met. And in fact, when we think about what is happening today, I can tell you this. We have an inclined group to do good. We really do. The challenge, though, that exists is our ability to take that inclination and interest and actually move them to act. So here's our plan today for the next 40 minutes. I ask that whatever your experiences are with your kids, that you hold that to the side for a minute. Whatever experience you had with your employees, you might, be, you might have had to send an email this morning that said, stay in line for a sec. I would like for you to set that aside and just open up your mind to what we're finding out with this generation, okay? We're going to do it in three parts. The first thing we're going to do is talk about what are the motivators that we're seeing. The second thing that we're going to talk about is what we're finding in the workplace, because that's an interesting scenario. And then the third piece is just some last minute thoughts in general. Sound good? Are we ready? All right. First, let's talk about millennial cause motivators in general. It is hard not to talk about millennials and think through the consumer behavior that exists today. Because here in the United, not here, but in the United States, $300 billion will be spent by millennials on consumer discretionary goods. This is the wants, not the needs. Now, if you're a parent, you're probably like, that's my money, they're spending. <laughs> True. The generation in the United States actually has the largest debt borrowing at this scenario, but here is why so many, so many companies are interested in this generation, right? Spend a lot of money, it's easier to get with them than trying to convince a boomer, per se, who's at their end of their potential consumer life cycle to try and buy a product. Now what's interesting about this 300 number is actually 16 billion of that goes to charity in the United States. Now, how many of you have heard millennials don't give? 
Yeah, it's true. Well, some will say that. And what's also interesting about those kind of comments is, is that, yes, they actually do give. But here's what the most interesting thing about all of it is. When we see how a millennial gives or how they react, what we've noticed is, is that there's a lot of two things occurring, thoughtless and thoughtful type giving in general. How many of you have been at the cashier register and somebody said, will you donate a dollar today? You've been there? And how many of you said, can I see some tax information? <laughs> no one, right? And nobody starts out the year by saying, today I'm going to give 20 times to a run race walk. I'm going to give 18 times to all of these things when I'm approached. We don't do that. Why do you think we give thoughtlessly at times? Well, it's because we're human. We really are. We're emotional people that when we see somebody in need, we go and react to them. And it's true, millennials are just like boomers, they're just like the greatest generation, they're just like Gen X, they're just like everybody else that responds to emotional appeals to do good. What's also interesting too is that millennials are thoughtful in their giving as well. Now, uh, those of you who work for the United Way, you want everybody to be so thoughtful about your giving, right? That's the ideal scenario. But unfortunately, I have some bad news. Not everybody's as thoughtful as you are. Now, what we do see with millennials is interesting is, is that they tend to react to things that we never anticipated. At the beginning of the year, we, have a, we follow about 500 millennials, uh, and as we follow them throughout the year, we like to see what they do. We follow everything from their behavior online to their behavior with causes, how they volunteer, serve, all that. At the beginning of the year, we ask one question only. It is, who do you think you're going to give money to this year? And you should see the answers. It's interesting. Not what you expect. 95% of them will always tell us, I want to help my neighborhood. And then at the end of the year, we pull up their records, and guess what? Every international cause in the world is in there. So my research team has to figure this out, right? So we go to them, and we sit down and say, why are you such a liar? No, we don't. We don't do that. That's bad research. So we sit down, and we say, we're curious. We noticed that you like these kinds of causes, or you gave to these. We say, I did not give to those causes. Again, we as a researcher say, well, you're lying again, because I have records. But no, we don't say that. So we say, all right, well, let's look at some of the things that we do know that, you, that you've given to. And we'll sit down and say, actually, I gave to that because my friend said it was a good idea or that this was something I was going to get involved with quickly, or I don't actually remember that I remember the video. A lot of thoughtless environments. But then what's also interesting too is some of the most notable things that they'll remember that they gave to, some of the localized neighborhood things that they did. May not be the most, but I'll tell you what, they're the first ones to tell us specifically what that money was going to do. So there's hope. The second thing is feedback. How many of you are on Facebook? Raise your hand. Okay, keep them up. How many of you ever posted something and nobody liked it? It's awkward. It's okay. <laughs> it's completely awkward. So we live in a feedback world, a feedback environment. We completely do. Um, we, we want feedback. We're gonna, you're going to offer feedback after today's session. You know, I wants that. You're going to get feedback. The, the Radisson wanted feedback where I stayed, TripAdvisor, all these other kinds of things that exist. Well, we live in an environment today where you do not have to wait anymore to figure out how my money affects the people I want it to. How many of you do annual reports? I have bad news. Here it is. In no other industry is it completely acceptable to wait 12 months for a report on performance. No other industry. Imagine if you went to the doctor today and took a cancer screening and the doctor said, I will take your money today and 12 months I will let you know whether you have cancer. <laughs> Not possible. But we allow it in our field. What's interesting though is that millennials, you'll often hear, oh, I, they really want to know the impact of their gift. As the researcher who actually put that piece out there in 2010, we retracted it in 2013. Why? Because we figured out something else. Is that the millennial, yes, does care about the end piece, but they actually care about the process that you go through to use gifts, to use their assets. This is Generosity Water. Generosity Water has created seven points of contact each time. 
that they want to communicate back to the millennial. They say, I am not going to wait until 12 months. I am going to do this every two weeks. Derek, thanks so much for giving your donation. I'm going to identify a village in the next two to three weeks that your money is funding. I'll be back in touch three weeks later. Derek, we just did that. Now we're enlisting the water committee. You can see it here. What we have discovered is that millennials do care about impact like anybody else. What they honestly care about is knowing that you're working on their behalf, that you are helping them along the way get closer to one thing, the emotional need to help somebody else, potentially in their localized neighborhood or wherever it's going. This form of process marketing that you see here isn't going to go away. It is going to get stronger and stronger. And as an organization, United Way or others, I say please, please embark upon a method of communicating during the process of impact rather than waiting until the end. The third one is around blending. This is what we've seen considerably uh, in the United States where we're blending social sectors together more and we're blending the for-profit marketplace with the social marketplace uh, as well. We've got things around cause and purpose and our personal values are all getting there. And now this is challenging the United Way model, if I'm being candid. This is where the millennial brings in their social and cause personal values into the workplace. And at the same time, the workplace who has historic other cause interests are beginning to clash a little bit. And what do we see? Challenges. Lack of participation or lack in participation in giving and so on. But do we really want an employee base that just does what the company says they have to do? Do we want our environments to be like it is anywhere else, diverse with ideas and values, where the company values what they want to do and what they want to support? Millennials that we have tracked, where the company in the first onboarding of them getting in said to them, we value what you believe in, and that's why we're giving you time off to go into the community. We value what you believe in. That is why we're giving you money to match what you give. And we value what you care about. That's why you're going to work with teams and create your own projects to help this, make this neighborhood better. Now, I want to also educate you about why we also as a company care about these things. It is an and proposition, not an or. We have moved to say, well, if you don't do this, you're not a part of it. We're out of that space now. Because the millennial, like every other younger employee that will come to them, Generation Z and whatever name we're using now, they will come with their ideas as well. And the biggest issue that you don't want people to feel is, is that they weren't valued. The other thing is, is that this beliefs in the purpose of who they are. Every millennial we talk to, they will always tell us, I have a big purpose. I want to make a difference. I want to do all these things. CSX, the transportation company in the United States, has one of the best involved and engaged millennial workforces. And they are in a very different industry, not technology or others. When you talk to their employees, one of the first things they'll say is, I love working on projects where I get to transport things from cities to cities to make people get what they need. Some would say, well, that's purpose. It's profitable purpose, but it's purpose, and there's social pieces built into it. You don't need to necessarily be a brand where it's a one-to-one -one model, or you have all these other things that exist. Regular companies need to show and experiment and help people understand that. The fourth one is assets. This, by far, is the key and biggest piece that we've seen. Three years ago, we finally figured out that millennials view every single asset as equal the asset of time, the asset of network, the asset of skill, and the asset of money. And when you only ask for one, you devalue the others. It is imperative that as we go forward that we view individuals as having assets holistically that help causes and issues. We're no longer just about raising money, we're about raising people to help people. We're about raising the assets and the skills that they have to make sure that we can affect education and income and health and all these things that we do. We're at a point now where it's no longer just acceptable to just give money. And millennials have told causes that. And so you, I, I implore you to go out 
and create campaigns like water.org does. It says, today I want you to donate something that nobody else is asking for. I want you to donate your network to help our issue. And then tomorrow I want to come back and see if you'd be interested in donating an hour or a half hour virtually for us. We need to look at the way we engage with causes differently. We're not just donors anymore. We are people that support issues holistically. And we need to move beyond a singular lens of involvement of where we are. So those are the four major pieces we've seen. Now, there are some tactics out there that we need to talk about as well that, that have all, always have been there but have really been heightened in the years to come. Let's talk about social networks in general. Everybody believes if you're on social media, you're just going to get millennials. They're going to come, come to you, right? How many of you had the board discussion where somebody said, well, we've got 1,000 followers. Those will be 1,000 donors, right? Yeah, as we laugh, as that doesn't happen. Well, here is what we've noticed. In the social environment, there's a couple things that actually happen. We are the most closest to four or six people all of the time. All of the time. Whether it's the workplace, whether it's our personal lives, whether it's our faith, whatever that is, we're the closest to four to six people. Now, in Facebook, you will be able, there will be friends that you went to high school with that will try to be a part of that four to six people. They ask you for a request to be a friend, and it's awkward decision time, right? You're like, we were not really friends then. Now I want you following you now. So, but, but realistically, those individuals will maintain our outer circles. And quite honestly, if anybody that I went to high school with that I never really had a strong connection with asked me to do something for a cause, I would say, that's nice. But if my wife or some of my kids or their friends did that that was closer in there, I would act. That's because we are human people reacting to emotional things, and millennials are just like that. That's how marketing becomes successful. And what we've noticed in today's environment that to be a cause today, it's hard not to be a social cause. It's hard not to stay. We want you and your people. We want to be a part, we want your people and network to be a part of us, to be a part of this issue in general. When we track millennial giving, 85% of it will be attributable to four to six people. It happens and it happens often. What's even more interesting is, is that in the workplace, 75% of all gifts are tracked by four people in the same department to that individual. It has nothing to do with the CEO or the manager. The next one is actions. How many of you have ever signed a petition ever in your life? Yeah. So uh, we follow people, right? We, we got to figure out what they're doing. So all of a sudden, one of my researchers comes up to me and says, Derek, we got a live one. That's, that's code for this is going to be exciting, research time. <laughs> so he says, one of our millennials just signed a petition that said, if you sign this, world hunger ends tomorrow. And they did it. And we're like, oh. So we were thinking, do you think the individual believes that they're really ending world hunger tomorrow? So how many of you think... Yes, raise your hand. How many said no, raise your hand? How many are so nervous to be wrong? <laughs> Absolutely. The answer is, it had nothing to do with the issue per se. The major reason why that individual actually signed it, or a lot of individuals did, is because it was all about them. It was all about actions, our support, for our external network to know that we care about issues. We would sit down and talk to them and track people that did it. And we'd say, well, so you believe strongly in world hunger? I'd say, I actually believe in hunger, but I want people around me to know it's an issue I care about, an issue I want to do. So what we've noticed is, is that actions, actions are simple commitments to the cause, to the issue. When you lead with asking for money, commit five hours, do all of those, you're not allowing the individual to just do a small action to commit to the issue, where some people really want to start out with. Not everybody is ready to be on the board. I hate to tell you that. 
people move in cycles. And sometimes, and this is the most interesting part about cause engagement that we've studied, is that it is completely acceptable for people to move out of your circle and come back in. I know as the lovers of your cause that that is not possible or on the list, but it really is. We have life cycles, we have challenges and things. We're human just like you. But here's the most important piece, that as you build people to make commitments, you have to help them move from one place to the end. If you went to a millennial now and said, give me every single one of your assets that you have right now, right now here, everything you own, where do you go from there? What's the possibility at all? Well, that's even not how fundraising works, right? We start small, build an annual fund, do all the typical things we hear about. That's because we're in a, in a mode today that helps build small commitment over time. Some people laugh at doing Facebook likes and all this other stuff. Well, it's true, those things may never get anything in the end. But here's what it does. It allows the individual to express to their network their commitment to the issue. And who wouldn't want people to show up in the public and say, I love the United Way for addressing this issue. The other thing that we've noticed too is that there is a turning key point where we gotta start moving people away from just being supportive activists of our message, meaning your message as a united way, into an organizing message. We have to move people to organize for themselves. We have to get away from believing that if we hit them three times with our brand, they will remember it. That does not happen. We have to move towards, we're going to use our marketing to help people to organize with their friends. We're gonna help people to organize around the issues that we address in their neighborhoods. Because we don't have the wherewithal, we don't have every single resource in the world to make everyone do everything on their own. That's an important piece. Some of the biggest millennial organization, or that had the biggest millennial donors, from a Pencils of Promise, Liberty in North Korea, Charity, all of those, moved away from a model that said, we're going directly to you but we're gonna to go to you and use, and you can go and organize on your own. Now is the time to create a model where it allows people to organize for the United Way. That's imperative. The third thing, solutions. Well, when you interview millennials, I'll tell you, nobody says, I do not, I, I wanna give because I just wanna give because. They all wanna to give to a solution, an environment that feels as if they're solving something that they're getting closer to what it is. Here's a message from the girl effect. Actually, this message did fairly well. Uh, are you, anybody familiar with the girl effects and their work? You should check out some of their videos and things, pretty strong. There's a couple of reasons why this did well. Let's take a look. The first one is, this is a moment that we can possibly ignore. Isn't this the moment that everybody should not ignore with the United Way? the neighborhoods, the things that we need to do. The best thing the girl effect does is they make it urgent and they make it reasonable for me to say, you're right. I can't ignore what's happening to girls in other countries. You're right. And you know what? I am in. I am a part of this. I am a part of the movement that is to shape what's happening over there. The use of participatory language, the use of real language that helps people understand that if I act with you, by the way, not for you, if I act with you, we're going to do something great together. That's a different mentality. Millennials, are you in the room? Here, here? All right. Non-millennials, I have a message to deliver. The four words on the screen the worst tested words with millennials. Now, how many of you love these words? All right, so I have been in the field for a while too. I love, these are great words. I mean, who could argue with community? Who could argue with impact or sustainable or empower? I have to warn you, I have not had a lot of millennials on a Friday night gathering together to talk about nonprofit sustainability. It hasn't, ha but I have been invited to several events. Maybe that one's coming. Here are the challenge with the words that we use in our field. The words that you see on the screen are wonderful words for us. But the vast majority of the world 
is a, is a participant in the cause movements you'll create. Not everybody's going to be the leader, be on the board, and understand these things. Now, community is actually one of the best words that describes people coming together, and this is a community here. The challenge is, is it's overused by a lot of organizations. So when the United Way uses the word community, so does the other organization around the corner. And so what is community today? The word impact, I actually like the word impact. It's in the project name, so it's really awkward to find out after many tests that our own word that we used wasn't in there. That was a fun conversation with the media not that long ago. Um, but here is the situation with the word impact. It's as simple by saying, when you give of your time or your skill, this person is different. It's different now, and they're going to be different in six months. Sustainable. Everybody wants an organization to be sustainable. But I'll have to tell you this, is that everybody in the public generally thinks organizations are already sustainable. When we call those things out, it's hard to get excited in around them. And then the last one is empower, which is actually one, a, a great word too. But unfortunately, that word could, could be used separately in other cases where we could just say, when we help people, they're different and they learn more to do on their own. The biggest thing that we've seen in solicitations and call to actions and all this is actually a generation wanting very authentic and transparent language that says, instead of using the fancy stuff that you have there, just tell us what it is you want. Tell us how we're going to get where we're going to go. What does it mean to be with the United Way? What does that mean? What does that environment look like? And most importantly, millennials give to issues. We care about issues. This is where the United Way needs to become the conduit for millennials to affect the issues they care about rather than being the end stop. You are simply the means between donor and beneficiary. You are the opportunity that has the historical, you've got the institutional knowledge to help that donor realize their potential with helping an individual. Make that bridge happen and describe that bridge and primarily the individual where you're going to go. All right, fourth one, before we get to some workplace, tangibleness. How many of you can say what a dollar does? We forced ourselves to, right? We live in an environment today where everything's equated towards a dollar or $10 or so forth. Now, here's what I have to tell you. We ran 10 different tests last fall during an end of year fundraising season in the United States. Half of those went to about 50,000 people, millennials, that had, your $10 will do this. The other half had, if you give, this individual will be helped. Who believes the individual story raised the most? Okay, how about the $10? Good, it was actually the same. It was split right down the middle. So there is no answer. What we've discovered is, is that yes, millennials, like everybody else, runs emotionally, and they run very statistically or impactfully at times. But what here was the most interesting thing out of all of it, we watched a campaign, Liberty in North Korea, based in San Diego, garnered 10,000 millennials to raise money for them and raised $500,000 in two months in November and October of last year. They removed every single tangible mention of $10 will do this or this, and it was all about people. They spent time raising people. Derek, you're close. You've raised this money. You're close to help another individual. We're ready. Today, we have helped 10,000 people. We're going to help 10,100 because of you. Everything was about less about money and more about people. I saw a 125% increase in giving overall by this generation. The solution is not so much that $10 equates this as much as it is your action, Derek. Your action helps the person. I'm going to equate every asset you have to that person. Because why? Because millennials are just like everybody else. We're emotional and human. We have tools to make it faster and quicker. So what that means, as you look at the millennial cause motivators, you'll notice that I didn't necessarily get into you got to be on Facebook or you got to do all these other things. But what you do have to be is 
be motivated to be the conduit for the millennial between themselves and the beneficiary. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Let's talk about the workplace. This is the common workplace. Is it, who has cubes like that? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, about 15 research partners in the United States. Um, by the way, we do have some Canadian data. We haven't released anything yet. But we do have about 15 research partners who are workplace from AT&T and some of these other big companies that allowed us to come in and figure out why millennials are doing what they're doing with workplace giving and service and cause activation. And what we noticed is that it had something a lot to do with culture and this one person called the manager. This is the typical workplace environment. In today's environment, we have teams. We have teams of people that are expected to produce and do things together that will help them create better things and products and services. We expect that if you're in that team, let's say those three people that are highlighted there in red, we expect that all, all of you in that team will get along, will do things together for the better outcome of the company. Are we all getting along? We're trying, we're trying. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that our culture today has changed. Our culture in the workplace shifted over the last 10 years to be, we want you to produce products and goods for us to we want to enable you to produce products and goods. And at the same time, hopefully you'll feel passionate and it's your purpose of what you want to do. The conversation shifted dramatically in the last four or five years. In the United States alone, by 2025, 70% of the workforce will be millennial. Because of that, we saw companies dramatically shift away from some top-down approaches and moved completely decentralized into these environments, giving more power to the manager, more power to the team than ever before. It used to be that when the CEO says it's time to embark upon a vision, we're just all going to do it, but not today. What we've noticed is, is that these three people that you see on that screen, those three will influence each other to do something. What's also interesting is, is that they find immense value and respect for their direct manager. If that manager provides them the opportunity to advance in two ways, First, professionally, and second, personally. Not every manager is there yet either. In fact, here's some data for you. 62% of the people in the same team will have higher positive rates of performance when it comes to cause work if they're in the same team. When we start splitting them up, doing company days of service and everything, it actually, perception and positivity starts to decline. Why is that? We found out that as in all the other social networks, remember four to six people, that millennials were highly interested in doing things with their own small teams. And in fact, CSX, Groupon, and others who are part of our studies, one of the first things that they do is they allow millennials to self-organize in the workplace and give them resources to affect a cause that they care about. They also create three things a triple-based platform that says, if you want to, as an employee, do this, you can. If you want to do this as a team, you can. And we also do this as a company. It is not our expectation that you have to show up for the company. It is our hope. It is the hope that in all of the other things you do, you'll see value in why the company is doing what they're doing. What's also interesting about this piece here is, is that the millennial manager if they volunteer at least one, or the regular manager, if they volunteer at least one hour this year, they are 25% more likely to suggest doing cause engagement or cause work than somebody who didn't do a thing. The managers today in the workplace drive cause engagement. It's also very challenging is, is that managers tend to overemphasize certain things when it comes from the top including the demands to say, it's time to do this, when the millennial says, I'm interested in others. Say, well, you have to do this because you are part of us. We got a hold of two emails and, uh, because we're doing these studies inside. And one of the emails said, the CEO said, this is what we're doing today. The other email said, you don't have to do this because the CEO does it. I hope you do it with me. 
came from a manager. Greatest response ever from a millennial said, because you said that, all of my friends in the company are going to do it with you. Just knowing the option was there. Now, what we also noticed too is, is that as you look, as a millennial goes through stages of hiring and going to companies, is that the actual cause piece isn't really high in the beginning. At the beginning, only about 36% of them come into the job interview and say, I want to work here because of all of the good things you do. It's not until the one person introduces it to them, which is the HR or the manager that they'll work with. And they get real excited. What the biggest challenge is, is that when HR doesn't actually equivalent to the same things of what the managers really want. We got some issues there. But what we also saw is that as it peaks, it starts to get higher and higher. And then it starts to go down a little bit. But where it gets the highest is in the first year of employment, where there's really interest, high interest in doing what you're doing or getting involved in causes. This is the singular biggest opportunity for the United Way that we have documented before and will continue to, is, is that the United Way being a part of that onboarding process to say this is, the, this is how we can take your interest, your instincts to do good and make it a reality with the people that we help. There's the opportunity overall. Now, I will say that days of service tend to decline as individuals, three, millennials were three years into the company, days of service went down. Their interest though in workplace giving and participation went the other way. There's some hope. So why do we see it that way? Well, here's what we noticed. Is, is that as the millennials started to give, they started to do it on their own. They weren't forced to anymore. And they had a greater interest of saying, I want to feel, I want to feel as if I can contribute more than just the service dollars or service hours that I have, which is really great. Now, I will say too that as we look at workplace giving in general, is that everybody wants options, right? Actually, we followed three teams this last year, and we'll debut this research in June. They didn't all have open-ended options. All of them had options from the United Way and a few others. And one of the biggest things that we heard is it was great to know what those options actually did. Not necessarily that we had them or what they actually did. And guess who sold it the best? The United Way, which is great. So here is where we go from here. You have to be a part of when the employee gets to part of the, in, their, in, their, in their companies. The United Way, somebody asked me, how do you feel about the United Way model? And, and, and my friend Evan Hotchberg, who is your chief strategy officer at Worldwide, and I have had many conversations. I've known Evan for a while. And I said uh, to him and I said to this other media outlet, I said, the United Way is the best solution that we have today. It's also have a very challenging perception issue internally. But there isn't any other organization that has the history and knowledge to make change happen in my neighborhood. The United Way is one of the best and most unique opportunities for somebody who really wants to make something happen in their neighborhood happen. But we gotta get people there. What we noticed is, is that when you can talk about your work directly with millennials, it's impactful. We just saw it from Calgary and others. So here I implore you to find the way to get directly with millennials to have that conversation. They're ready. They just need to have that with you in general. Provide the triple base platform that you need. Companies today need to provide those three things and so do we. Help an individual grow themselves. Help a team develop something with you and help a company as a whole. Those three are imperative. Those are the ecosystems that exist in the workplace today. It's hard not to. The other thing is, is the manager is so crucial. What's exciting is, is that we track millennial managers themselves and they're ready. They're ready to start getting their employees involved and getting other people involved that are other generations in causes and issues. So another exciting time too. Now, the manager can be the greatest or challenging gatekeeper when it comes to all of this, but that's where you can provide them with the resource and the tools to be successful. The generations incline. 
absolutely has been inclined from the beginning. In the United States alone, every single civic education program in schools, everything that's in the media has been created by boomers and the greatest generation to get this group of people to do something for good. It's there. I was just with Wendy Kopp at Teach for America. You know, she started that 20 years ago now in the United States. At that time, an idea of doing a year or two of service was just out there. And now look where they are. The concept of doing good is not foreign to them. They're there. We have to take it and do something different. Because in reality, I don't need any organization to do good. The advent of technology has allowed me to become closer to anybody that I could ever serve or help today. One of my friends sent me an Indiegogo campaign that I was helping one of their friends who was affected by cancer. My first inclination is, is, did you go through the Cancer Society? That's maybe what I was taught. And he said, absolutely not. This friend decided, who was younger, just to go out it alone. And I'll tell you this. For every practitioner that calls me and says, I have, I have to ask you a question, I have a millennial that will say to me, Derek, here's my idea. And unfortunately, I have to reply with, that sounds like Habitat for Humanity. You should probably go talk to them. Now, the response I get next is, I did, and it didn't seem welcoming. It didn't seem that I could take just a few things of what I had that I value the most and make it something that they could turn into or at least help somebody. When Gene Case and Steve Case, the founders of AOL, who've been funding the research that we do since 2009 came to us, they didn't come to us saying, Derek, we want you to help figure out and be the biggest millennial supporter out there in the world. They actually said, Derek, we want, to help, we want you to go out and research why and how so that our institutions who are at the forefront and the staples of our community can attract and engage this audience. This is about you. This is about the United Way or any organization who's been out there to attract and get involved. Get people to do things to express externally why they care about an issue. They don't need you to do good. There will be new technology that will exist that allows me to get closer and closer to the beneficiary. But does it matter? No. Because in reality, organizations of the future will find a way to say, you, I value you, and we value the people we serve. We are just here as a conduit to connect you to, to make it the most important for that individual than ever before. That's your value proposition. And you do that with an issue-based environment, we'll start to see some success. I started out with thoughtless and thoughtful pieces. I want to end with a, a story here. How many of you have ever contributed to a school fundraiser? <laughs> I have a four and a six-year-old. It happens. So um, in my neighborhood, there is this wonderful little individual. Her name is Lydia. So Lydia comes across the street to me. And she knocks on the door, and by the, by the way, uh, I don't know if this is the case here, but anytime somebody comes to our door like that, they always have the envelope and the one piece of paper, right? It's like where everybody's names are on there. So Lydia knocks on the door and says, Mr. Feldman, by the way, she calls me Derek every other time except this time. She says, Mr. Feldman, can I talk to you? And my wife's like, oh, no, this is not good. Because my wife, who knows what we, I do, obviously, thinks that I'm going to ask a ton of questions. But the first thing that Lydia comes out of her mouth, she says to me, I was wondering if you could support what I'm doing, and it was for, I don't even remember. And she goes, the reason I'm asking is because the Cotters, the Cotters are 80 years old, they're down the street, they love everybody, I do too, but they love people even more now. The Cotters sponsored her at $10 a mile. So my first, she goes, the Cotters have sponsored me. I was wondering, could you match it? <laughs> and my first reaction, my first reaction is, I wonder how healthy Lydia is. Like, <laughs> could she physically run a lot? Or is this like the Cotters, you know, they, they know something that I don't. And my wife is in the back and she's like, this, this is good. This is getting it. <laughs> 
Now, I'll tell you what. At the beginning of the year, I didn't think that Lydia would come to me, and I did not budget it. But I told her that I could not match her. But I would be willing to do other things if it was as important. And she said to me, I don't think it is. <laughs> so I gave $5 for Miles. She only did 5 thank goodness. By the way, the other time that's really nervous is when they come back telling you how well they did or how bad. And that's time to write the check, right? But she, so, so I don't end up doing this. And in that moment, what I really did was a thoughtless act of giving. I would have never done that ever before. Lydia did that. What I really wanted, though, is I really wanted more of a thoughtful piece from her. And I say this story is because Lydia can be any, like any other young or millennial or anybody else, is that it's easy to get people to give. It really is. I mean, how many of you have heard the, you should just give because it's for a good cause? You laugh, you're like, how is that possible? But people do that. Now, that is never going to stop. That's a lot of thoughtless pieces there. The greatest thing that you offer is a thoughtful environment between donor and beneficiary. That's the greatest thing that you have. And if I can use the United Way, me personally, if I can use the United Way to help the issue and the person that I want to help, that's where my value is. It's no longer about giving to, it's using. That's what millennials want to do. They want to use causes to get closer to the issues they care about. We'll sit down and interview millennials, and I'll tell you, a very small percentage, less than five, will ever say, I'm a donor of X. They don't. They always begin with, I care about this. I care about this. There's the value proposition we got to go forward. So I say this in that the generation's inclined, and really it's your cause that's their biggest activation point. And I hope that after today, you realize two things. Millennials are just like every other generation in how we respond, but they want to know that you're working with them. Not necessarily for them, but with them. And they want to get closer to the issue and the beneficiary. Let's make it happen. Thank you.